Well, I joined the Navy because uh, I'd always been interested in the Navy. I was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. And of course, it's a seaport town. And uh, I guess, too, the, the fact that the war come along also had an input uh, as to the time and the place. But uh, I had always had two things I was interested in was uh, uh, the naval uh, part of it and also radio. They had a boot camp uh, in several different towns, but the boot camp that I attended was in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And of course, that's where I was shipped from Jacksonville to Norfolk for my boot training. Well, it was a lot of grinding. They had, they did a lot of marching and a lot of uh, uh, teaching you discipline and teaching you how to take care of yourself. And uh, but a lot of marching, always on the grinder, what they call the grinder, and around and around you'd go on the grinder, day and night, almost. It seemed to me. We had one instructor that. Uh, was, I guess, a comic in a way. He had a, a, a full bucket like you would see in, in homes in those days, which I guess would hold maybe 10 or 12 quarts. And uh, from the way it looked, when you would look at the bucket, it looked like it was filled with sand. But when he would ask one of the members of the squad to go over and get that bucket and bring it over, they found out it was full of lead. And sometimes it was hard to pick up, and of course everybody got a good laugh on it. And that way, you, I guess it relaxed you, and you could go and follow the instructions a little better. But that was his gimmick, was that uh, bucket of lead. There was a lot of news and stuff going on Actually, before uh, they attacked on Pearl Harbor, and uh, and thinking back, we had uh, broadcasts from from Britain, from uh, well France before France fell, and uh, had pictures from Dunkirk, and we we were really uh, uh, the United States was kept informed, and of course. Uh, a Churchill broadcast, but also they had a uh, CBS had an American crew over there, uh, Edward R. Murrow, and he broadcast every evening. It seemed to me, so we were kept up with what was going in the world over there and the destruction. And I guess when we were devastated, it just it just astonished us that it could happen in America, and of course it did happen. I'm sure it had some impact uh, on my thoughts, but like I was telling you earlier, the, I had always uh, had thought about the Navy. When I broke camp, what they call uh, breaking your, your boot camp, they transferred me to New York City, and, uh, and in the early part of the war, they used different facilities and stuff that they could they could uh, use, and one of the uh, gathering points that they used for uh, for uh, people in transit was Pier 92 in New York City. And uh, originally, that was where all the ocean liners used to tie up when they would bring passengers from Europe and from uh, uh, the Mediterranean, Italy, and there. That's where they would tie up at. And they, uh, the Navy, to the government, and, and of course, record, uh, gave it to the Navy, Pier 92, and made it for a, a barracks for what they called people with FFT uh, for further transfer. And, and they stationed you at, uh, at that receiving, they call it a receiving barracks. And they gathered us there, and then they chose three uh, of the men that were in the, uh, had actually had left Jacksonville with me and gone through boots with me to go on a ship that was uh, uh, stationed in Staten Island. And it was a USS Zircon, a PY-16. And uh, 
the three men were designated. The one was going to be a, a radar man, one of them was going to be a sonar, and then myself, I was designated to be a radio man because we had all gone to school while we were stationed in Norfolk for the different ratings. And uh, we all went on board the Zircon at the same time. And that was at Pier uh, 6 in uh, Staten Island. And they were assigned to the Eastern Sea Frontier. And they run uh, uh, escort for, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, convoys up and down the East Coast. And, uh, and uh, that was uh, what that ship was designated to do. And of course, I stayed aboard her two years. And uh, that whole time, we ran uh, convoys up and down as far as, uh, as South America. And then the other escorts would take over and take them over to the Mediterranean and to uh, Africa and south to the, uh, to the different countries uh, south down below Brazil and Argentina. We never had a confirmed U-boat uh, 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 kill or hit, but our problem and the United States problem in that days of the war, they didn't have sufficient uh, escorts to escort the uh, ships, the merchant ships. And a lot of times when the merchant ships, if they were going, say, from New York to Key West, they would try to run it by themselves. Or also there was uh, the fact that if you were in a convoy and you broke down or had any problems, they could not drop an escort back with you. and. That was a lot of, a, of the uh, problems that the Americans ran into when, when the submarines were so uh, deadly on the east coast of the United States, is the fact that, that we had an insufficient uh, number of ships. In fact, about, I would say, out of maybe six or eight escort ships in a convoy, uh, about half of them would be either British or Canadian. A lot of Canadians. Canadians had a ship they call a frigate and they had a ship they call a uh, corvette. And a lot of those were assigned to American uh, waters in the, in the South Atlantic to escort uh, convoys. Uh, but that was part of the problem was uh, getting enough escort ships to protect the convoy. But, but that we did that in '42 and '43, and part of 1944, the early part of 1944. You wouldn't believe it. It's a different world. If you were a seaman, now I'm not. I'm not talking about uh, uh, rated guys. If you had a rate, you you. Uh, but if you were a seaman like John Bassett was, you were four on and four off. And if if you had the the uh, lookout on the on the starboard the flying bridge. You were there four hours, and you went down and slept four hours, and you went back up four hours. But also there was what they call turn two. At eight o'clock you turn two, and you turn two from four until eight in the afternoon until eight from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon. So if you got off watch at eight o'clock in the morning, even though you'd been on four hours. And the and the boats of May whistle turned to you turned to that means you went to scrubbing the deck you went to cleaning you get whatever you were assigned to do painting uh, peeling paint chipping paint whatever you were assigned to do you did it and then when your next watch came up you had to go back on lookout and that's why I decided one day. I had a, about all four on and four off I could stand, and I got myself a seaman's rating and got on what they call the wheel. Now, the wheel's the helmsman, and they, they're assigned two on and six off, which is much better, <laughs> much better. Uh, and I guess they don't want the helmsman going to sleep, you know. And so I got, 
I got myself a rating, a seaman's rating, and they put me on the wheel, and I got off the four on and four off. But that's the way it was in that in in that navy at that time. On the, on the bridge, you have an officer of the deck. In other words, he's and the way that you uh, proceed with a convoy, if you say you're you're assigned up front, well, the convoy is only doing probably about eight knots the whole convoy, and and you're uh, you're uh, assigned a certain area to sweep with your sonar or whatever for submarines to protect. And what they would do, they would zigzag. The escort ships would zigzag. That way they could cover more uh, uh, of the area with their defenses, you know, with the sonar and the radar. And they would zigzag. And then when the, when the officer would call out the orders, whatever, they had pattern they had set up at right uh, five degrees right of you. You have a rudder indicator on up on the uh, bulkhead in, in the wheelhouse. And if he calls for fi right five degrees rudder, left five degrees rudder, you you pull the wheel over till your rudder indicator goes to where he says, because he knows exactly how that ship's going to go. He knows it takes a mile or two miles for it to turn or whatever. He, he, he's, he's learned on that. So when he calls out, Right, five degrees right, you give him five degrees, you repeat it. You repeat it when he calls it and repeat it when you get there. Then usually after he'll, he'll give you which way he wants to go with the ship, he'll give you a heading, what he call that, come to 360, which would, or zero, you know, or 180 or whatever. He'll give you the, the uh, reading on the compass he wants you to come to. And you repeat it too, so he will know that you know what he wants to do. And then when you get to it, you call it out and tell him that that you know that's where you are. And that's uh, uh, essentially what the wheel wheelman does all the time. If you're coming in port, it's a little more, I guess, complicated. But usually, uh, when they come in port, they have what they call a quartermaster on the wheel. Then a little a rated uh, guy, guy with a rating. But in uh, in uh, out at sea, uh, they would use seamen on the wheel. I uh, I reported to the uh, officer. Like I say, it's every two hours, and it I probably was on ten to midnight. I can't remember. But it was at night. It might have been midnight to two. But I reported to the officer of the deck that the wheel was not, the, the rudder was not responding to the wheel. And he acknowledged it. And I went down and went to, to in my bunk and went to sleep. Well, about an hour or two later, they were down getting everybody up again. Come to find out what had happened in this the turn of the ship, you have a big yoke, and it, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but actually your rudder's pulled by cables, steel cables. And uh, some of those cables had gotten fouled up. So in order to, uh, to clear them up, they had to put what they call a jury rig and switch the steering from the forward from the wheelhouse to the stern, and it gets kind of complicated. It's it's a bunch of uh, blocks, and everything comes to a capstan, and they were missing one of the blocks. And so they started asking everybody, where is the block, which is a snatch block. It has a wheel in the middle of it. And John remembered where that block was up on the yard arm. We had used it while we were painting the yard arm while we were in Staten Island, and John forgot to bring this, the block back down. So the chief boat says, John, you left it up there. You go up and get it. So I was perched up there. Now this ship can't move. It's wallowing in the water. 
And one day, one one time, as I would look down, I'd see the uh, Atlantic Ocean on the port side, and when I'd look down the next time, I'd see the, the Atlantic Ocean on the starboard side, and then when I'd look down, when everything was, I could see the deck. <laughs> so uh, it it scared me a little bit, but it it could have been bad, but it but it turned out okay. We got the block down and got everything fixed. And another thing that happened to that ship that might be interested, the uh, Coast Guard, well, the United States, had weather stations in the Atlantic. And uh, they, uh, just before I was, actually uh, several months before I was transferred off of it, they sent us up to Boston and put, um, all this weather uh, equipment aboard and put, I think they called them aerographers back then. Now they call them what? Meteorologists, I think. I think they've changed the name or something. But uh, they put all that uh, uh, weather uh, balloons, they'd, they'd release a balloon about 11 o'clock, I think, every morning and then one about uh, 11 o'clock at night so they'd have readings at noon and they uh, read the temperature and the uh, barometric pressure and everything all up. They, they explained it to us and, uh, and a little bit anyway, but uh, we sailed for the Coast Guard uh, about the last, uh, I guess the last two or three months I, I was on it uh, at a weather station. The main, main uh, uh, job on, on the Zircon was was uh, convoys mainly. I know, I think we we pulled a convoy out of the Gulf one time. It must have been at least a hundred ships. It, it went on and on and on. Uh, a lot of ships, a lot of tankers, especially. And of course, a lot of people don't realize that in late of '42, uh, when they invaded. Uh, 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 Algiers and, and uh, French Morocco and they were there, uh, Casablanca and in North Africa. They needed a lot of supplies to keep uh, uh, the American uh, army going and, uh, and that was the route they took, would come off the east coast and go down to the, um, the top of the South America and then turn and head over to uh, uh, Africa, and that's the way they supplied it. Now the Britain, Britain and uh, and uh, and Russia, they supplied the other way up through the North Atlantic. Uh, we didn't run any any of those convoys. All of our all of our convoys were to the south and and to the uh, uh, east. But the uh, the uh, convoys that that supplied. Uh, uh, England and and uh, and the Russians they went up through the North uh, Atlantic. After I'd transferred off of uh, the Zircon, they transferred me back down to Norfolk to another receiving barracks. I was never uh, never permanently assigned to any well other than boot camp. Once I broke boot camp, I was never uh, permanently assigned to, to a land base station. And they transferred me to uh, Norfolk FFT again for further transfer. And uh, I guess it was about the first week in July. I had been running, I, by then I had a rating. I was a boat mate. No, I was a coxswain. Third class, I was a coxswain. And, uh, and, uh, I was working a crew over in the mess hall there and uh, came back and the, uh, and the uh, chief said he had a, uh, had a spot for me and uh, I was going to Boston. So uh, they got me ready, I guess, maybe in within a day or two and gave me my orders and the, and the uh, the orders read to the USS Purdy in the Boston uh, in the Navy Yard. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, found out it was a new ship that was being built in Bath, Maine. 
It actually wasn't there in Boston yet. So we went there to some receiving barracks there to wait for it, and it arrived uh, within a day or two from Bath, Maine. That's where they had built the ship, and it was the uh, USS Purdy uh, DD-734. And uh, they assigned me to the to the uh, crew, and uh, I I believe they had a little trouble with the shafts. They did a lot of work on, anyway on the ship in the uh, shipyard there before they sent us out to sea again. The shafts were uh, not um, they were not straight. And it, and it caused the ship to vibrate, especially the uh, the uh, stoop structure and everything. They they felt some vibrations all in it. And uh, what they did, they they uh, uh, took those propellers off of them, and re uh, the struts come down there, it, towards the back where the where the shafts come out of the hull. Then they have, there's some struts. And they straightened those up, and when they put them out, the problem was over. And we went to Hamilton Bermuda, which is what the, they call a shakedown, where you try everything out, all the guns, uh, uh, the engines. Uh, you run it, just about everything you can think of, run a test on it and just see if everything's okay. And then if it passed muster, then they'll, the Navy will accept it from the shipbuilder. And of course, that's where we, we ran our, uh, our shakedown was over there. And uh, once, once they, uh, they get through with that, then they assign you a duty. And we came back from Hamilton, Bermuda, I believe it was in either in late September Early now the ship was put in commission in July. I think July the 18th. I can't remember the exact date. Do you remember the year? The year? Uh, 44, 1944. Yeah, and uh, we were coming back. I think it was in late September, and they had had reports on uh, bad weather, and we ran into a hurricane, and. The Atlantic on the way back, and that knocked us around pretty good, but didn't no damage to us that you know was significant that we had to go back into the shipyard, and they assigned us to what they call a, a kind of a plane guard. When a, when a plane takes off of a carrier, sometimes they don't know whether that plane's going to go up in the air or not. So in order to be sure, in case of something does go wrong, they assign a destroyer on either side of the carrier, and most of the time one in the rear of it. And then if they have to abort the flight or the plane gets dunked in the water, uh, they've got, they have somebody there that, uh, to pick them up. And most of the time it works. Uh, that. They don't. Uh, they don't lose as many pilots as, you, as it, people would think. Uh, it's it's well planned to make sure that safety factors. You know, there's there's somebody there all the time to protect them, and they assign that to us for the late part of uh, '44. Then '45, we went through the uh, Panama Canal and went over in the Pacific. And we got ready. We didn't know which island we were going to invade, and we were getting ready to invade Okinawa. And as it turned out, and we went to Pearl Harbor first, and from Pearl to Inuita. I believe we transferred some soldiers from Inuita to Guam, and then I believe it was in Guam. That we staged the uh, the uh, task force that took the uh, soldiers and Marines into uh, Anawita, no, into Okinawa, and that was on the first day of April in 1945. That was the invasion day, 
and actually the first day of the invasion there was very few problems really I was a pointer what they call the pointer he's the guy that that aims the gun and fires it uh, and he controls the vertical uh, uh, position of the gun and your trainer which is over on the on the opposite side the the pointer is on the left side of the gun uh, of course we had twin guns that had, had twin uh, mount to five inch 38 so they had uh, three of them two forward and one half and the uh, pointer is on the left hand side of the mount and the trainer is on the right hand side and he's the guy that trains it he trains it this way. The pointer trains it up, uh, points it up and down, and the pointer is also the one that, that fires the gun, unless you, you uh, fire control. Uh, if, if, if they're in control, you, you lock your mechanism, and they fire it from the fire, from gun control. And that, that was my, uh, actually on the Zircon, that was my position. I also was the pointer on the number one mount on the on the Zircon, but uh, that was that was my, my what they call general quarters position. But by then, I believe I had made uh, boats made second. I believe in probably in October of uh, '45, maybe November of '45. So I'd moved up one more rank, uh, one more stripe, and and. Uh, but still, like I say, that was my uh, gun, general quarters position on both of those ships was a uh, pointer on the number one gun. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, talk even before Okinawa on uh, kamikazes. It had started out during the Philippines. And also uh, another thing that people don't realize, they also had a, a boat. It was about a 28-foot boat just about like you'd see in in Lake Jackson or Lake Oconee it was 28 feet long and it also was armed and it was a it was a, a suicide boat and they had two uh, two uh, they had a, what they call a oka bomb and a baka bomb and and they were uh, like an air like a uh, unmanned uh, airplane uh, what what the drone like now one of them, and I can't remember which one, I think it was the Oka was man, but they were both uh, uh, just one time. In other words, they set them off and whatever they were supposed to do it was just one time. Invasion of Okinawa come along about the third day. You might just say all hell broke loose. And uh, they started putting, uh, 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 suicide planes in the air every day almost well they they would skip a day but the bad days were the third the sixth the ninth and then the twelfth and also uh, after the twelfth we we had to go into a, a, a repair ship down in Camerado but on the third they had a, a, a big battle and on the 6th of uh, April, the, uh, I believe it was the Lindsay, which was a destroyer like us. They, they were assigned to, well, they had, they had a, a grid of destroyers around uh, Okinawa. They call it a, 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 a radar picket uh, defense. And they were all about 50 miles or so from from the, from the island and where the uh, transports were. the The idea was, if you have a ship there with five or ten thousand men on it, you do not want that hit with a, a suicide uh, plane. And what we do, they do, they they set up this defense around the island with the with the destroyers. And that way they could protect the transport area, which they did. They never did. Um, they never did get in there. Never did. 
but on the 6th, I believe it was, was when the Lindsay got hit, and she took a, a kamikaze just forward of the bridge, and I don't know whether you people realize, well, uh, ships nowadays are much larger, but uh, the story is about, about 400 feet long in those days. And uh, they took a hit just forward of the bridge, and it blew everything from, from the bridge forward off of that ship. That ship was didn't have a bow on it at all. And then uh, I believe it was on the 9th, and I can't remember the name of the ship. They bombed it, and it started a fire down above one of the number two magazines. And there's always a problem. If you, if you remember seeing the movie or uh, the films on the Arizona, when the Arizona blew up, that was a magazine going off. All that black smoke coming out of there, and uh, that that was a problem. So the captain pulled the Purdy up next to the the ship and took about half the crew off and the captain and then our firefighting you have a, have a firefighting uh, uh, crew there's assigned that uh, at general quarters they put the fire out on the ship and trans and they transferred the uh, the cr captain and the crew back to the uh, damaged ship and they took it into port we took up the station on uh, what they call a Roger Peter One, which is a radar picket station number one, which is uh, it's a little west of the island. So you're right in line between Okinawa and Japan. In other words, the first people they're going to see is you. So we had been to general quarters for a day or two, really. And uh, that's when they, uh, when they, uh, Gunnery officer uh, announced to uh, open fire, and uh, I'd say uh, I'd say at least thirty or forty or fifty airplanes were uh, coming in on us, and we fought a good battle. Now the ship that was with us, which was the uh, Cason Young, and I did not see the plane. We were on a we were on another aircraft with our sights, but their uh, surface to air radar was knocked out. And I, like I say, I didn't see that plane, but I saw the plane that flew across their uh, uh, stern, which is the one we were on. It was not, and that, that's another thing people don't realize. A lot of those planes were not suicide planes. They were. They were going back home, but uh, they dropped their bombs and left. And uh, and the uh, the, the uh, aircraft we were on dropped the bomb, and it hit on the uh, port uh, quarter of the uh, of the Case and Young, and it exploded. It didn't do uh, too much damage, really, because it hit right on the edge between the deck and the hull when when it uh, hit the ship. And they had to retire because they didn't have any way uh, of uh, seeing the uh, getting the guns in on the aircraft because they had lost their radar, uh, the gun controls and everything. And uh, and uh, so they turned and went and retired, and we of course had to stay. And we fought a pretty good fight, but. Uh, The last plane in the air, we just we just couldn't get it. They say, and they're probably right, that what he had was a 14-inch projectile. Now that could have been a a shell or a. Uh, of artillery or anything, but anyway, the report we got back from the people that's supposed to know, when the plane was almost to the ship, it released the bomb. It hit the water and kind of glanced up, and it 
penetrated the hull on the starboard side, I'd say uh, maybe five feet above the water and cut a perfect hole, just a perfect hole, 14 inch hole through it. And when it, where it went in is what they call a scullery where you wash your, your uh, trays and everything. And um, it went in between the scullery and the bread locker. Now, for it to keep on traveling, if it if if it had hit maybe five feet towards the bow, it would have been in the mess hall, and it would only had <coughs> two structures to go through the, which would have been the outside hole on one side and the outside hole on the other. But because of where it hit, it had to go through the through the uh, hall. It had to go through the the scullery, it had to go through the bread locker, it had to go through the uh, <coughs> passageway where we came, when you would come out of the mess hall, drop your tray off, you'd go up on the upper deck. And then they have what they call a CIC room. It's right in the center of all this. That's the combat information center. There they They're the guys that started their computers. When it uh, went through that passageway, it penetrated the wall on the CIC room. And as it went through the CIC room, it hit the overhead. And when it came down off of the overhead, it penetrated a bulkhead on the CIC room. It exploded. That blew up all that control, all the mechanism out. The uh, next compartment over was the uh, steam table where you, you, you got your food and everything. And to the rear of that was the uh, uh, the number one fire room where where the, uh, the it, you have a fire room and an engine room. You have a fire room and then an engine room. And where they made the steam and everything to, to propel the ship. And we were doing about 36 knots when that thing hit. And uh, when it penetrated the wall on the uh, port side of the CIC room, it exploded. And it opened up a hole from the fire room to the mess hall, up through the main deck, all the superstructure you have, what they call flying bridges. They, they extend over the main deck and, and, and out to the outer side of the hull. And it tore all that in. And on that, on that deck, you also have uh, 20 millimeters mounted and also uh, on that station right there on that port side is where the firefighting crew met. They, that's where they were stationed. So they got caught in the explosion too. But it killed everybody in the CIC room and, uh, and everybody up through those decks that were on those guns that either blew them overboard or killed them one or the other. We got up power and everything on our own and, and re returned down to what they called Camaretta, which was, uh, like I say, a small island south of Okinawa that they had occupied actually the day or two before the invasion. And they had repair ships there. <coughs> and they temporarily, temporarily repaired us enough so that we could get to uh, Guam. So they sent us out on the night of the 28th, 28th day of April. And we had the ship that had, the bow had been blown off on the 6th. It was in tow, uh, uh, seagoing tug had it. And everybody in the convoy had something wrong with them. They'd, they'd either uh, 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 been hit by a shore bombardment or, or uh, uh, kamikazes or something, or uh, they'd been bombed by planes. They were all crippled. 
we were we were in better shape than the, than most of them in the convoy. But the night, night we left, of course, we had orders not to fire because we there, there was no way for us to, <coughs> to defend the, con, the, the the group we had, uh, uh, not sufficient anyway. And the night we left, they were tracking uh, uh, Kamikaze. He, he came right over the top of us. And then the, the Comfort, the USS Comfort, which was a hospital ship, and it was lit up. He dove into the uh, the same plane that I, I often wondered why did, why we didn't shoot him down, but uh, I guess they didn't know he was going to to crash into a hospital ship, and that's that's exactly what he did when he when he cleared us over us. He dove into the uh, into the USS Comfort, which is a hospital ship, hit hit in the operating one of the operating rooms. And killed a lot of people, of course. So there we came back to Guam, and we had some bad news. They said we got too many ships in here. Go on, Pearl Harbor. So we pulled into Pearl Harbor. We have too many ships in here. Go on, hooray! So we go into San Francisco, Embarcadero. The city by the bay, <laughs> and uh, we pulled in there and said, "Yeah, we'll re we'll repair you." So they did. They fixed us up good as new, and we went back to uh, join the invasion for uh, Japan proper. And about a day or two later, they said, "Well, they were going to call it off. That we were going. They were going to surrender." And uh, in fact, I think it was 14th day of August, and they were going to call it off, and um, and we would go to Japan with the occupation. So we pulled into a, a Yokohama, and it, it wasn't on the 2nd of April, of uh, September. It was not the day they signed the papers. It was a few days afterwards that we pulled into uh, Yokohama and joined the uh, occupation forces. And then they moved us down to the next town, down Big Town. We call it Yokosuka, but I think they call it Yokosuka. We've stayed over there about, I guess about six or seven months. And we uh, we ran the mail, we we ran soldiers, the, the uh, occupying forces to uh, different small towns. I think one of them was Wakayama and uh, Curie. I got to go to Curie. We went to Curie several times. And of course, at Curie, is, uh, Hiroshima is on the same side as Curie's on, but Nagasaki's, uh, Nagasaki is across the bay from, from, uh, from uh, uh, Hiroshima. They had a uh, seaplane base not too far from Curie. Curie was a big port for the uh, Japanese over the years. They'd been a big uh, shipbuilding uh, uh, port. They had large ways there. I guess those ways, they, what what they have on a way, uh, they got to have a case like a locks on a on a on a river. Uh, they can open up and let the sea water in, and and it, they can build a ship on it. In other words. And then they can open up the locks on that back of it and float the ship and float out. Or if you want to work on a ship, you can open them up, let the water come in, pull the ship in, put the chocks on it, close the gates and pump the water out, and then you have the ship high and dry. And I'd say, uh, I think there's some locks, some uh, maybe in some of the Scandinavian countries that are larger, but... Uh, they're about as large, big, they must have been, I'd say maybe uh, 1,500, 2,000 feet long. I think that's where they built that big uh, Yamoto, which was the largest ship in the, in the world at the time, warship. And of course they sunk it when it tried to come down to uh, Okinawa and relieve the, 
the Japanese there, they inter the task force, the Fifth Fleet, intercepted it and sank it. So we ran, uh, we ran uh, occupying forces. We ran mail. We we did a little bit of everything for about six or eight months over there, and then we came back to the United States. Came back through the uh, canal, and w we were sent back to Newport, Rhode Island, and we were stationed there maybe a couple of months. This was in 47. And then about a month or two later, we went back to Boston. And that's when I decided to get out. I had been in a little over five years then. And I, for some reason or another, I just decided to, I'd had enough of the Navy. <laughs> a war is hell. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I would say uh, I'd hate to be in, in Iraq because uh, we did not have the restrictions evidently that are put on them during World War II. I know, I know we didn't. I, and I, I can remember, uh, of course, it would be obvious to a sailor on a ship, if you met somebody at sea, he would have to be the enemy, you know. It's, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm sure a foot soldier in the field would have problems that the Navy wouldn't have. It's bad, bad uh, business, and you have to give the young people credit for being able to adjust yourself or whatever because you're leaving the United States and going to Iraq, which is a different world. I mean, you just, you got to face the facts. That's a different world. And the same thing, of course, when we met the Japanese on the head, it was a different world. But we knew who the enemy was and, and uh, there was nothing restricting you as far as, uh, as, People did not. I don't. I don't. I, I never uh, witnessed anyone. We took some prisoners one time on the island of Ishishima, which is where Ernie Powell was killed, and I believe it was the night of the sixth. They the radar detected a boat coming from the mainland over, and they took. Uh, I think it was seven men and one woman. And I'm sure there were soldiers, and they had probably put on civilian clothes. But we didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, uh, nobody uh, beat on them or anything like uh, they say is going on now, like the enemy does us. I, I don't see how uh, the American officers can expect the U.S. soldiers to tolerate the stuff that they have to go through over in, in Iraq. I don't, I don't see how I, they're able to, to keep their sanity almost because that's a terrible war, terrible position to be in.